Yeah, a uh, very good evening to all of you. Welcome you all to our uh, today's webinar on PCOS. As you all know, PCOS is one condition which affects women of all age groups, starting from adolescence to young girls, women in their 20s, women in their 30s, and also women in 40s, wherein long-term sequelae of PCOS is seen. So there is a wide spectrum of symptoms uh, which affect women with PCOS. But in today's seminar, we're only looking at the fertility aspects of PCOS, wherein the impact of PCOS on infertility, that is that the chances of getting pregnant. So uh, to join us on this webinar along with me, I have Dr. Pallavi Chelsani with me, who's a fertility specialist with Birthright Rainbow. And also we have Dr. Brindavani, our diet expert, who is going to enlighten us with the uh, importance of diet in PCOS. See, as we all know that PCOS is just uh, considered as a hormonal disorder, but what we fail to understand is that it has got a metabolic component as well. So in metabolic component, and that is the reason we see that women with PCOS, 75% or more are obese, in whom the mainstay of the treatments is weight loss. So in order to address these issues, the importance of diet and lifestyle on PCOS, we have Dr. Brindavani to talk to us on that. So let, before we start our webinar, let's try to understand actually what is this all about PCOS. As I told you, PCOS stands for Polycystic Ovarian Syndrome. And it is also known by several other names like PCOD and then water bubbles and then PCOS. So the several other names, I'm sure you will all, all come across those kind of terminologies, but the right and term is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So basically, as I told you, PCOS is a complex endocrine disorder wherein there is a hormonal imbalance. When I say hormonal imbalance, there is an imbalance of hormones which is secreted by the pituitary from the brain. So that causes an increased production in the male hormones which in turn causes a problem in, with the egg release, that is ovulation. We see that quite a lot of women get affected with this PCOS. The statistics say that about 10% of women are affected with PCOS, but in actual reality, we see that it's far more than that. We see about 15 to 20% of women who are affected with PCOS, and in them, majority of them do have these problems with infertility. So they do have problems in getting pregnant. But the best part is that with treatments, more than 90% of them get pregnant. So the, the first and the foremost question obviously is like, why is that only certain women get affected? So the question is, why me? We have several of these possible causes. Is it a genetic factor? Or is it because of the kind of lifestyle we're leading? Or is it just because of the diet? And obviously the answer would be all of the above. We see that PCOS usually runs in families. That is, you know, you tend to see that your maternal side, your paternal aunt, or somebody has got this problem. So there is a gene which is linked with PCOS. So in case if you inherit that kind of a gene, there is always a tendency to have to suffer from this problem. And also because of the kind of lifestyle we are leading, that is a very, very sedentary lifestyle, is also another risk factor which puts women to uh, developing PCOS and obviously the diet as well. So all these three factors are implicated in the causes for PCOS. So the basic thing what happens in PCOS is that usually women with PCOS have irregular cycles. So when they have irregular cycles, it means that their egg is not ovulating well. That is, egg is not growing well and it is not getting released. So just look at this picture in there, where in the first picture, we are talking about a normal ovary. So a normal ovary, the way it functions is that once a woman gets a cycle, that is on the second day of the cycle, because of the hormonal production by the brain, the, there is one egg which starts to become the lead egg or the lead follicle and tends to grow. And by day 13 or 14, it tends to ovulate, that is gets released. And then at that point of time, if women have intercourse, then the chances of pregnancy is good. But the same thing, if you, on the contrary, if you look at the PCOS ovary, what happens is because there is a hormonal imbalance, 
the follicle that is the egg doesn't grow very well and does not reach the size where it has to ovulate so obviously there is no ovulation happening and that is the reason women with pcos tend to have difficulty in getting pregnant spontaneously and also tend to have cycles which are irregular so there is a whole lot of this hormonal imbalance which is causing the problem with egg growth and as well as egg release so usually what are the various symptoms which women go through when they have pcos so as we all know it has a wide spectrum of clinical uh, features the first and the foremost uh, problem with a pcos is that they have irregular cycles so usually these irregular cycles can start off from the very beginning that is when i say very beginning this is right from the menarche but in the first time they get the period so when they get the period the first time the second cycle actually can be after about couple of months or so usually irregular cycles in young girls that is between the age of 13 and 18 could be normal also but even in pcos we see that they have irregular cycles so when we say irregular cycles it is a cycle which comes you know once in 35 days or more than that and we do see women you know have bleeding once in two months three months or sometimes you know, even it can go up to six months also and in some unless they take a tablet or you know take some hormones they usually don't bleed so irregular cycles is the first and the foremost symptom of pcos and sometimes the period can also you know not even come for about two years also so wherein we have to you know give them some hormonal support for them to bleed and in such women what happens is the lining of the womb gets thickened and thickened and it because of there is a one hormone deficiency called progesterone there is no bleeding which happens and apart from that the other symptom with pcos could be that they can be heavy bleeding because that there is irregular shedding of the lining usually if they don't bleed for 45 days or 2 months the lining gets very thick and thick and then once they have this bleeding it tends to be heavy so when we say heavy bleeding it is nothing but something which gets prolonged for more than 5 to 7 days time usually the bleeding lasts between or normal flow is for 3 days and then it can sometimes you know and go up to 5 days also but in women with pcos it can really uh, is prolonged up to 7 days also and then the other important uh, symptom which is noticed by women with pcos is excess hair growth when i say excess hair growth the hair growth is seen in in all the you know uh, on the face the chin uh, on the abdomen on the upper half of the body and on the thighs and including the back so there is this excess hair growth which is seen in women with pcos and the reason for that it is that there is an increase in the male hormone levels and then apart from these symptoms the other symptoms which women go through with pcos would be acne there is excess acne which is seen on the face because the it makes these male hormones make the skin very oily and it causes regular breakouts on the face chest and the upper back and the other important symptom is that there is a severe weight gain usually 80% of women with pcos tend to have or uh, tend to be obese there are another 20% who are lean pcos so wherein they just have this hormonal imbalance but 80% of the women go to obesity and usually this hormonal imbalance is the culprit there which causes them to put on with excess weight irrespective of you know them doing a diet or you know or you know being very physically active things are not too much under their control and then to, they tend to put on a lot of weight and the other important symptom especially when the hormone imbalance is very severe we see that there is a male pattern baldness especially the hair on the scalp gets thinner and there is severe hair loss because of the increased male hormone levels and also we see that there is a darkening of the skin also which is seen especially it is seen on the neck and the reason for this is because as i told you this, this is also a metabolic problem so there is a insulin resistance the insulin is a hormone which is important for the metabolism of glucose that's the sugars in the body we see that there is insulin resistance and that is the reason we see that there is darkening of the skin especially on the neck so these are all the symptoms you know what women go through but what kind of an implications does it have otherwise on a woman's health the first and the foremost is that infertility 
is the first and the foremost problem because women, the PCOS, only 5% of them get pregnancy, uh, you know, spontaneously, but the rest of them definitely will need to have, take some treatments, which we will be talking in detail. My colleague, will, uh, Dr. Pallavi, will be speaking in detail about that. And women with PCOS generally go through gestational diabetes in pregnancy. There is a high risk of mis miscarriages and premature birth as well. And as I told you, there is a metabolic syndrome component as well, wherein 85% of the women are obese and there is insulin resistance, which is seen both in obese uh, and as well as in lean. And the other long-term sequelae of PCOS would be that there are there is definitely a risk factor for them to develop diabetes later in life, risk of developing cardiovascular disease, both, I mean, have suffered from sleep apnea, depression, anxiety, develop some eating disorders. They can have abnormal uterine bleeding and also so they can be sometimes at the risk of developing cancer of the uterine lining as well. So when a woman has got these symptoms, but it doesn't, you know, having these symptoms always doesn't mean that they have PCOS. So it is important for us to have a right diagnosis. So the right diagnosis can be achieved when uh, you know, by meeting the three criteria, which is first is the symptoms. If she has got irregular cycles or if the egg is not growing and ovulating is number one. Second thing is via a blood test, wherein a blood test is, is taken to see if there is any increase in the male hormone levels. And the third is by performing an ultrasound scan, wherein we look at the ovaries. So we tend to see that there is a polycystic appearance, means there's a multifollicular appearance of the ovaries. So out of these three criteria, if two criteria are met, then a diagnosis for PCOS is made. So the first and the foremost is that symptoms-wise, if they have irregular cycles or if there's a failure of ovulation happening. Second thing is in the blood test, if there are excess male hormones. And third, in the ultrasound scan, if there are there's an appearance of multifollicular appearance, then if two criteria are met, a diagnosis for PCOS can be made. But generally, we tend to see that a lot of scan reports wherein they give a diagnosis of PCOS, which is actually not right, because we cannot make a diagnosis of PCOS just based on the ultrasound report. So the next question would be, what happens if you're diagnosed with a PCOS? Then in this today's discussion, we will restrict ourselves only with, with infertility, in, I mean, the impact of PCOS and infertility and how to treat it. So basically, a woman with PCOS will definitely have a problem in getting pregnant because there is no egg which is, you know, growing, growing and getting released or getting ovulated. So they do have problems in getting spontaneously. So I'll have my uh, colleague, Dr. Pallavi, to take it from here. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really nice to meet you all again on this platform from Birthright. So from... Uh, from management aspect, I think we will deal with it now. It's really nice that all of you understood what is polycystic ovaries and how it can affect the incidence and how to, how uh, you can make out when you are at home or uh, when you really want to know that you have PCOS. The clinical features, the symptoms, everything has been very clearly uh, made a point. So from uh, management part of you, we'll take it further. So coming to the treatment, as everybody knows what clinical features you have to look into for PCOS, like, you know, acne, hyperandrogenism, which is uh, just overgrowth of hair or male type of baldness and uh, the metabolic abnormalities and uh, uh, the irregular cycles and, you know, the infertility issues. So today, as a fertility team, we are going to treat mainly, uh, tell you the aspects of treatment, especially on the fertility side. So mainly when somebody comes with you know, problems of irregular cycles and, uh, you know, the PCOS uh, pattern and uh, everything. I think the first uh, thing which we really want to do is the counseling. We really want to counsel the couple so that they actually know what's happening with them, if they are on the right track and if they have any, uh, not only looking into the infertility aspects, but also looking into the other aspects like metabolic problems and, uh, you know, the obesity part of it and uh, the correction of uh, the weight and all the aspects would be looked into. So probably you would definitely get a proper counseling from us. Uh, coming to the management, just to make it very interesting, I have divided the management part into four categories, which is like the first category is Miss PCOS. 
in miss pcos meaning the uh, the patient has polycystic ovarian problems like whatever has been mentioned that is the irregular cycles or obesity or hirsutism or acne so in these uh, who are unmarried so i'm mainly concentrating in miss pcos is like unmarried uh, women who has these problems so the major problem definitely would be the problems mentioned on the slide that is the obesity menstrual irregularities acne and the hirsutism so coming to the obesity part of it PCOS definitely the main thing which really everybody has to concentrate or the first choice when you are diagnosed to have a PCOS should be a lifestyle uh, modification so in lifestyle modification as everybody knows it's only uh, through two ways that's diet and exercise so diet in detail dr brindavani would be dealing with and uh, exercise i will be dealing with so in exercise it is very very important that at least a moderate exercise of at least 50 to 60 minutes per day at least five days a week is really really important and the diet part low glycemic index low carbs low fat and rich in protein and rich in fiber is what we are going to look into the details would be dealt in very much detail in the further slides so coming to the irregular cycles especially in miss pcos I really wanted to emphasize that first of all, what is an irregular cycle? So any cycle, if it's in between 21 to 35 days is supposed to be normal. If somebody is bleeding less than 21 days, or if every, if somebody is bleeding uh, like 45 days once or two months once, then probably you have to consider it as a regular cycle. And in PCOS, especially as Madam has mentioned, uh, there is a lot of scanty flow uh, or there is a decreased uh, you know, uh, menstruation or decreased blood while during menstruation and some people might not have pain at all and some people might have pain so these are the important things which we are looking into in irregular cycles so in miss pcos basically uh, what happens is from menarche the menarche also can be a little earlier generally the age of menarche is from 11 years to 14 years would be the good age to attain menarche but in case of pcos it might be a little earlier when uh, the menarche might be almost like eight eight years or ten years so from that time if somebody is having a irregular cycle i think more than the women who is uh, the adolescent women who is suffering their parents are more concerned that the uh, you know the periods are not on date so they tend to take this 21 day pill which uh, generally gets you a proper period but i really wanted to make uh, a specific note here saying that uh, you have to bleed every two to three months in case if you have irregular cycles and if you are a miss pcos case if you are unmarried but the problem with taking this 21 day pill or a 28 day pill continuously you can take it for one month or two months just to in case if you want to regularize the cycle or in case if it's a you know milder version of pcos probably it might be helpful but if the pcos is going to continue the same way and if somebody is uh, being put on this 21 day pill or 28 day pill for a longer time let's say we have patients wherein uh, they have been taking for almost three to four years so that is going to cause or put your ovaries and your system into sleep and it is going to actually uh, from pcos it is going to take you to some other problem like uh, decreased eggs which means pcos as you understood it's increased number of eggs and because of taking this 21 day pill uh, for a longer time is going to decrease the eggs so that's even uh, more bothering to make somebody pregnant uh, from our side so make sure that in case if you are unmarried and if you are being put on 21 day pill or 28 day pill continuously for a longer time i think it is better to seek a fertility specialist uh, opinion just to make sure that you are on the right track of taking those pills so the correct treatment for miss pcos with irreg irregular cycles would be a seven day pill or a five day pill which is just a progesterone pill you can take it every uh, like two months once or one and a half month once so that whatever endometrium the lining which has uh, been uh, come uh, because you, these pcos people do not have progesterone in them so probably this progesterone pill would make you bleed and uh, uh, so we are contracting uh, something called endometrial hypoplasia or endometrial carcinoma so if you leave uh, cycles for six seven months probably the endometrium would be too thick and it might lead to these situations so make sure you just take that seven day pill or eight day pill and a good lifestyle and uh, you know a good uh, workout would help you to deal with it until uh, you really you know you come to a stage where you're getting married and when you're planning a pregnancy and so the next important thing which we 
generally put on my PCOS is metformin. So the polycystic ovarian people, the other problem they ha really have is this insulin resistance. So what happens is the insulin receptors are resistant to the insulin drug. So when whatever they eat or whatever the sugars they consume is going to convert into glucose. And the, the, as everybody knows, the glucose is counteracted by a hormone which is called insulin, which is produced from your body. So when this insulin resist, uh, uh, there is a resistance in that receptor, what happens is this insulin will not be acting on the receptor and uh, there will not be a decrease in your glucose level. So you might uh, land up having, you know, high sugar levels or all the sugars, if you're not working out or if you're not burning the calories, it might turn out uh, to be an increased fat. So generally they put them on metformin drugs. So metformin is an insulin sensitizer, which can be used uh, for quite a good amount of time to decrease this uh, hyperinsulinemic state. And this also can revert back in 50% of the patients. The problem is uh, mainly anovulation, which is that uh, the uh, ovary is not releasing the egg by itself. So in most of the people, sometimes when we put them on, uh, you know, the five day pill and then metformin and then proper exercise and diet, they might get back or revert back into having natural cycles. Uh, so coming into the other problem which a Miss PCOS lady can have is hirsutism. As everybody knows, hirsutism is an extra growth of hair. Either it can be uh, in, on face, chest or abdomen or uh, it might be a male type of baldness as you can see on the slide. It can be a too much of acne. So all these things are just because of uh, your androgen levels are high in PCOS. So the majority of people who will be suffering with this have to seek a medical opinion, whether if all this is because of PCOS or not, because there are any number of causes, other causes which can actually cause hirsutism, acne, and all this kind of problems. Uh, so the other problems like, you know, the, there is something called Cushing syndrome, or there's something, other thing called as ovarian tumors, which can secrete this uh, hormone, which is called androgens. Androgen secreting tumors, which can arise from ovaries or from the adrenals, also can give you a picture like this. So if you are sure that it is not all that and it is only PCOS and then probably you are in the right track of dealing with it and uh, probably you can just go ahead and uh, the treatment for this, as everybody knows, it's only epilation or if you can go for a laser treatment or a waxing or a threading, which generally people do. But make sure before you go for these treatments, you should be sure that it is just because of PCOS and not because of any uh, you know, androgen secreting tumors or something else, we are not missing out on anything else. So there is another criteria wherein uh, we have come that is newly married couple who doesn't want pregnancy and she has been diagnosed to have polycystic ovarian syndrome or disease. So in these people, this is the people where I really, really wanted to emphasize that lifestyle is a must for everybody. Let it be Miss PCOS or a newly married or already married, I mean, married people who, who are already trying for pregnancy. So lifestyle is not going to change. Your diet is not going to change. Your exercise pattern is not going to change. So these are the people wherein we can give 21 day pill. So this 21 day pill or the birth control pills or the hormonal pills, which generally we give uh, to, you know, get a cycle are exactly preferable only for these uh, uh, scenario people wherein this is going to help them in two ways wherein they're going to get their cycles on time and it's also going to prevent uh, ovulation, which can uh, be an irregular ovulation, meaning not on time ovulation uh, in case of PCOS people. So unwanted pregnancies can be prevented. And uh, and this why in these people we can give this 21 day pill is because someday down the lane, uh, probably in three months or four months down the lane, they're going to change their mind and they're going to try for pregnancy. Uh, so these are the only patients where you can put them continuously for two, three months or six months also probably on OC pills. And uh, so there is another scenario wherein this is Mrs. PCOS who is, uh, you know, married and who is trying to conceive. So in these people, the fertility team is going to really help them because the problem in PCOS, as everybody knows, is anovulation, meaning there are a lot of uh, follicles inside the ovary. Generally, there should be eight to 10 follicles, but in these people, uh, there are little more number of follicles, meaning if it's more than 12, we call it as PCOS. So what happens here is, in a normal person, a follicle grows every month and it releases an egg. So once it releases an egg, that egg is responsible for your period or a pregnancy. 
but the problem with PCOS here is they are not able to release their egg on their own or the start of the follic I mean, follicular recruitment might happen but it might get arrested uh, in between uh, meaning it uh, it might not reach the maturity level and then it might stop and so the main problem is ovulation so here is the fertility team which is going to really help you with some drugs wherein we can interact and uh, get the follicle with some drugs like you know clomiphene and letrose whichever drugs i have mentioned here and there are a few injections also which we can uh, try on so going to ivf so there are two scenarios or two situations wherein uh, we would prefer injections or we would prefer an ivf cycle there are two drugs wherein we use for pcos people with all lifestyle modifications and putting you on metformin and the other drugs like myoinositol and all that and still we are not able to get a follicle or uh, that that uh, situation is called a resistant pcos situation so in those cases what we do is the next level we would try giving you some injections which are called gonadotropins and uh, we would try seeing if a follicle is developing in case if the follicle is developing with a minute dose then probably we can try uh, getting you pregnant if the male factor is normal and if the tubes are normal if there is no other problem other than pcos either by just uh, asking you to have timed in the course at your home or we can do a simple procedure like iui uh, but when when do we take a call for ivf is a main question now so ivf is nothing but a test tube baby so the test tube baby this call we take when there is no absolute growth either by using your uh, oral uh, ovulation induction drugs or we have already tried with the injections with a minimal dose and then still we are not able to attain uh, the whatever the good quality of uh, follicle or good size of follicle then we have to take a call on this something called ivf for pcos so especially ivf for pcos in this case what we do is uh, definitely your lifestyle is going to again continue throughout and uh, the diet and exercise should be emphasized and in IVF what we do is we give a little more doses of uh, the injection so that we we can you know make the follicle grow and uh, we can pick the egg out and make a baby and then do our embryo transfer and make you pregnant so I really want to emphasize on uh, one more thing that is the Leo's operation Leo's operation we see a lot of patients coming in uh, asking for uh, second opinion whether we have to go for this operation. Leos is nothing but uh, in a polycystic ovarian syndrome patient or a polycystic ovarian disease patient, it is a surgery uh, wherein we make some punctures through laparoscopy, meaning we uh, in in a normal terms we have to say that we make some burns on the ovary. This surgery has to be done very meticulously by a, a person who has been well trained and who has a fertility background because they know the value of the ovary and the, you know the follicles because the disadvantages is if this this procedure if it is not done in a right hand and in a you know in a proper manner it might damage too much of uh, ovarian tissue and we might go into uh, some other condition called uh, decreased ovarian follicles or uh, we might lose on follicles where in pcos i think you clearly understood it is a good number of eggs or more number of eggs but we might uh, you know shift to the other side which is really bad that is decreased number of eggs uh, so when you're opting for the leo's operation or if somebody has suggested you a leo's operation there's definitely nothing wrong taking in a second opinion uh, or uh, consulting another doctor or uh, you know um, thinking twice before you go for the surgery because it is a irreparable damage if it's not done properly i would definitely suggest to go ahead with ivf which is uh, you know in vitro fertilization or a test tube baby instead of you know damaging the ovary through doing that procedure and when do you have to really really opt for this procedure is in case whatever situation if the ovary is not responding meaning we have tried with oral ovulogens and also injections and still the ovary is not responding to give out a follicle or if there is a hormone which is called lh hormone which is generally very high in pcos if the hormone is very high probably doctors might opt for this uh, so this is the only place where we have to opt for this uh, treatment which is called leos so that is about the mrs uh, pcos and so now she's happily pregnant once she's pregnant i don't think so we have to leave her at that point also because pcos people who have uh, you know got treated and then got pregnancy are very very precious they are definitely not like a normal uh, conception people 
because they have a lot of miscarriage rates they have almost 40 to 50% which is a quite a huge number uh, of miscarriage rates and they might land up having uh, high sugar levels which is called uh, gestational diabetes they might also have high thyroid levels and sometimes you might see them coming up with shooting blood pressures and uh, with a small baby meaning uh, the baby's growth might not be up to the mark uh, like if if the baby has to be 14 weeks if if, if the baby is like 8 weeks that's that said up not up to the mark baby and sometimes you uh, you might have uh, uh, pre term deliveries like the baby is getting delivered at 7th month or 8th month so here i really really want to emphasize that probably you might be called for extra scans and extra blood tests meaning uh, uh, one or two scans extra in the antenatal period and you might be called every fortnight to see your uh, doctor please don't hesitate to see them because it's all for your good which uh, they are doing it for and uh, probably blood test a couple of times more is uh, definitely to keep a check on your sugar levels and the thyroid levels so that you don't land up in all these situations screening for diabetes definitely at the first visit if a polycystic ovarian patient gets pregnant it should be always in the first visit in case if the uh, if the patient is uh, already a diabetic patient uh, which is called an over diabetes we would definitely start them on uh, metformin or uh, if if she has uh, if she has to take some insulin definitely we'll put them on insulin also we would definitely take an endocrinologist opinion before we do all that and in case if she screens to be negative on the first visit then regular screening would be done fasting is very very important and we give 75 grams of glucose and after that after two hours we take a blood sample to see her sugar levels so metformin if we have started prior to your pregnancy and uh, we would definitely like to continue it for a while just uh, just to make sure that your sugar levels are on track and also to make sure that you don't have an recurrent miscarriages i mean uh, an abortion or a bad uh, scenario in pregnancy so there might be a scenario wherein there is a mrs pcos with secondary infertility uh, so there are a lot of patients who come up and say that my first pregnancy was all well and I never had PCOS with my first pregnancy. Uh, but uh, it's really uh, you know worrisome that I got uh, PCOS in my second when I'm trying for the second pregnancy. Can this really happen, doctor? This is a quite common question we keep getting. So yes, uh, probably PCOS it can come in any time of your life. Uh, the main reason why PCOS can come in in the second. Uh, when you are trying for a second issue is because after the first kid probably we tend to uh, the the mother's tendency would be the concentration would definitely shift to the baby and the self care would definitely be less and your diet your exercise everything would be less so i think that's the reason why you have uh, the trait when you have a trait or family gene which uh, actually you're carrying and then it you, you know it turns out to be a proper pcos uh, after you know ha having a first kid so there is always a chance uh, of having pcos even for when you're trying for a second second baby uh, so in these cases when somebody comes for secondary infertility we make sure that uh, the rest of the things like tubes and the male factor and her age everything else is not causing infertility and if, if it is just pcos i think uh, i've already discussed the ov oral ovulations and the injections and the treatment modalities so we're going to do the same thing with uh, even for the secondary uh, infertility people so i think we have uh, done with uh, my, the most of the infertility issues and uh, the things and the pregnancy as well and in case i really want to stress in case if you know you finished your family you finished your two kids and then after family planning also is done i think the pcos is going to continue and so your diet and exercise is going to continue throughout the life you have to always keep a check on your diet you have to always keep a check on your you know other scenarios which is very very important that is the metabolic syndrome which we really really wanted to stress on that is 40 percent or 40 it is interestingly 40 to 85 percent of the women with pcos are obese and these people have increased risk of diabetes, cardiac problems, and uh, you know the lipid problems. Lipid problems are cholesterol problems, and they might have mood changes like anxiety, depression, and uh, binge eating and eating disorders. So all this have to be taken care, not only the fertility part. So these are the important uh, aspects which we would definitely ask you to you know be cautious even after completing your uh, family. And uh, there is no wrong taking a calcium tablet after 30 years because the PCOS is more prone for osteoarthritis and breaking bones. So I think after 30, if somebody is diagnosed to have PCOS, 
uh, prior or after 30 uh, please take a calcium tablet every day so that you, your bones are safe so that's where the treatment part is over and uh, the in blood investigations the the crux of investigations which we generally do for pcos or a patient for pcos as a general is the general test other than that we would definitely like to look in for prolactin thyroid sugar levels in case if they have uh, problems like hirsutism acne or if they have baldness these are the list of tests which we would like to do like testosterone dhes in case if somebody has to go for an ivf treatment after uh, everything then probably these are the hormone tests which we would like to see which are the reproductive hormones so on ultrasound this is how a pcos uh, picture looks this is how a normal ovary looks these are the follicles which you can see and uh, generally when we see on ultrasound it looks like the normal ovary looks like seven to eight follicles and a pcos ovary looks like this with more number of follicles that is more than 12. and the uh, the important thing which we really look uh, on ultrasound is the endometrial thickness as i already told you uh, in whatever stage the pcos is if the lady is not uh, menstruating on a regular basis what happens is this endometrium gets thickened so she has to has to bleed every two months that is very very important so to prevent her from endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial cancers uh, so this is all what we have spoken about uh, how how do we treat if uh, there is already a pcos candidate but how do we prevent it for the next generation that's very very important i think uh, the the pcos mothers or uh, you know somebody who is looking uh, taking care of a pcos daughter will know the struggle which they are undergoing so we do do not want this uh, to happen for the next generation so as you can see in this picture there's a lot of junk food which uh, you're feeding the kids and uh, tv time and you know uh, eating while playing uh, indoor games this is not really at all appreciated so the games game time or the outdoor game time has to be increased please give them healthy food don't give them any tin food or junk food or you know packed food which has a lot of carbohydrates or fats always make sure your kid has a proper diet and uh, you give them proper veggies and fruits which they have to really have outdoor exercises are a must nowadays i really know that uh, you're very scared to send your kids because of this covid situation uh, you can still ask them to do skipping which you can uh, do along with them at home and you can also do a little gardening which uh, you know which is definitely a stress relieving thing and which is going to help you your children and the adults and kids to keep out of uh, pcos so this is what we are going to see for the next future generation uh, who do not have pcos and happy smiles uh, so diet from the next uh, scenario, I mean, from the next slide, Dr. Brindavani will take over. She's going to tell you about diet in PCOS, which is very, very important for a PCOS candidate. Thank you. Thanks, Pallavi. Thanks, Priti, for introducing. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the PCOS diet. That's very important because, you know, uh, when you talk about infertility and then, you know, you look forward for a pregnancy, uh, trying to recover from a PCOS is very, very important. So before I go into it, I'm trying to discuss uh, the five different things. That is, like one diet doesn't suit for all, and we have upcoming many new diets uh, of late, you know. So they don't give us any promising results. And how to calculate the calories, and what kind of di diet guidelines that we need to stick to, and what kind of food choices we need to take, and what could be the additional diet guidelines. So when I say one diet doesn't suit for all, it's a kind of, you know, a situation that PCO is multifactorial. You have a lot of, uh, this a picture is there where you can see that you have two quadrants of the PCOS system. That is the lower part is the inflammatory system and the upper is the metabolic. So when you see any PCOS lady, we need to understand whether uh, we are dealing with an inflammatory or uh, related PCOS or uh, even a metabolic syndrome is also there because the diet guidelines uh, differ a little bit for both metabolic and inflammatory situations of the PCOS. And suppose we find uh, uh, a person with, you know, inflammatory uh, situation, you know, we're going to avoid a lot of inflammatory foods like, you know, uh, fructose corn syrup that is mostly used the sugar in all the baked products and the trans fatty acids. And you're going to change your oils from omega-6 through omega-3. That means omega-6 is the sunflower oil and omega-3 is the kind of, you know, canola oil or soybean oil. You're going to cut down the refined sugars and you're going to cut down the processed foods, no fried food and, you know, butters and, the, you know, kind of sweetened beverages. All these are inflammatory 
when the hormones are actually in the PCOS lady are into inflammatory situation. So what could be the anti-inflammatory foods are, you know, a lot of citrates and omega-3 fatty acids and a lot of micronutrient rich foods, nuts and fatty fish and berries. Now, suppose if the lady is into a metabolic risk profile, so it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, somebody who's into inflammatory situation, we're not going to deal with exercise and sleep and things like that. But mostly, you know, the inflammation part is addressed along with diet and exercise. I mean, the regular diet and exercise. But when it comes to a metabolic risk profile, the more emphasis will be on to diet, exercise and sleep. Of late, a lot of studies are showing that, you know, the sleep also regulates the hormones and helps PCOS. But there's another questionnaire that we really need to look uh, because this is a questionnaire which tells us, you know, what kind of eating disorders we have. That is called a SCOP questionnaire. So whenever we have, see a PCOS lady owned to metabolic risk, like metabolic risk would be a high lipid profile and, you know, a high insulin or insulin resistance and central adiposity and the other factors related to metabolic risk, we're going to ask this, you know, five questions. The second question and the fifth question actually uh, tell us about the metabolic situation. The first and the third and the fourth questions generally, you know, that is called uh, anorexia. And because, you know, the any lady, it's like uh, a higher BMI will have a PCOS and the lower BMI doesn't have a PCOS is never the issue. Both can have the PCOS. That means, you know, anorexic, uh, small build and, you know, poor eating young girls also can be into <clears throat> their young age, could be into PCOS, you know. Um, this is a kind of a questionnaire where it can answer both the uh, BMIs where they're into an eating disorder of under eating or over eating. So whenever you ask a question for yourself, you know, um, are you lost control of eating, you know, you're just not uh, counting your calories or not keeping a watch on what you're eating. And if you think you're always food dominated in your life, like every time that you look forward for food, somebody offers you food, you're eating it would mean uh, you're more closer into the metabolic risk profile. <clears throat> Nowadays, a lot of diets have come. This is very, very important because, you know, uh, doing a weight loss is different and losing weight uh, in PCOS for fertility or looking forward for good health is different. These two are two drastically different issues because somebody wants to lose weight is just like, you know, correcting your BMI or looking at a favorable weight loss number on your weighing scale, that's a very different issue. But uh, if you want to lose weight, having a PC voice, and then you're looking for a fertility, uh, and then after fertility, that would mean you're looking forward for nine months of pregnancy, and then, you know, postpartum, that means you're looking forward for good health for next 24 months. So that would mean you're, uh, you're prepping up your body or you're priming your body for the better health for, you know, two years of um, nourishing or, you know, into the antenatal period of growing your uh, fetus and then delivering and then breastfeeding, that would mean uh, your body composition and your internal hormone metabolism and your um, kind of, you know, the overall built of body composition should be so competent enough to do the two years, um, you know, extended uh, performance in you. So somebody trying to do a liquid diet or, you know, raw food diet or intermittent fasting or keto diet or zero carb diet, Atkins diet, don't really work because, you know, they, uh, they don't help uh, the protein metabolism. They don't help the hormone metabolism. They um, may also predispose, you know, insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia or, you know, tiredness and, you know, lack of energy to do exercise and things like that. So a lot of diets which are uh, now or upcoming new diets, they don't really suit the PCOS women. So, you know, PCOS is something that you're doing a diet to change your hormones, to change your metabolism in favor of getting much better inside. So, you know, it's just not uh, doing a diet uh, to make a, a weighing mission number happy there. So when you choose a diet for PCOS, I think you need to consult somebody, look into your blood work and understand whether you have a metabolic problem or you have both metabolic and inflammatory problems, or you have, you know, severe obesity and inflammation and less of metabolic issues there. So you really need to know which direction you need to take yourself to get better inside. So calories, uh, luckily now uh, we've really come up with uh, good uh, ways to calculate the calories to be given. So we don't take the idle body weight. We just take the present body weight uh, and then we calculate the basal metabolic rates. 
and uh, of mean you know somebody uh, who just wants to do a basic diet without calculating the basal metabolic rates or total daily energy expenditure can take the existing body weight multiply by 15 and then minus 5 to 600 calories you can do that would be the goal of uh, calories that can be taken but you know professionally you need to calculate the basal metabolic rate basal metabolic rate is the amount of energy the body spends with it doing any activity that means you're just lying down on the bed and the amount of calories the body spends like for your heartbeat or you know the vital functions is called as a basal metabolic rate now then you add the t that means total daily energy expenditure component to it that would mean uh, how much of activity do you do in a day and uh, are you sitting do you do a work or you do go for a workout or you do some yoga or what kind of exercise do you do that calculates the total daily energy expenditure so once you know your total daily energy expenditure you can also cross check with your you know this was uh, client uh, how many calories they do consume see at times you know you would get somebody who's just barely on a liquid diet and consuming 500 calories and you know even your total daily energy expenditure calculation looks you know much larger than what they're eating so you know you need to actually um, you know, recalculate yourself so what's the best calories that you can give to her to actually increase the metabolic rate because you know uh, just a calculated number cannot work on the metabolic rate so you need to understand what the lady is taking with the 24 hours and how the energy levels are there how much of fatigue she has and you know there there could be symptoms of headache and you know less activity mood swings and you know not sleeping in the night and things like that maybe they are working more than 14 hours a day um, or they have a very stressful month this month or next month or a couple of months they stress so you know we really need to know how much of energy expenditure they do and how, what energy levels they have and what the activities are and the moods are then calculate your total daily calories and decide how many negative and I mean negative calories you're going to do i mean basically you can go to 500 calories negative but you know suppose um, there's a lot of binge eating in that lady and she's stressed and she's she's in a big family maybe you know just giving a 1000 calories or 1500 calories may not suit her so you know you just have to decide uh, carefully what calories you're going to give and try to evenly distribute the calories of late you know i do see uh, women trying to uh, finish their calories by i mean the carbohydrates by evening 5 pm and then they're still working till 1 o'clock in the night and then they're trying to put uh their calories um, carbohydrate calories from morning eight till evening five and trying to see they're going to lose weight no uh, it all depends upon how many hours you're going to work and you're going to distribute your calories uh, or your carbohydrates over the period of time because carbohydrate energy is the one thing that the brain actually works on you know so you need to distribute your calories in such a way that you know you really beautifully uh spread your calories for your performance of the day and there are two different uh, kinds of diets which are you know kind of uh, very low calorie diets and liquid diets but these give a very poor energy state because pcos is just not diet it's about a lifestyle change that you're going to do an exercise a good um, eating pattern and you know uh, kind of sleep and then being active you you're trying to bring, bring about total different energy metabolism in you so trying to do a very low cal diet like 400 500 calories or a liquid diet um just kind of uh, 24 uh, hours just liquids actually doesn't give a great result um, for either weight loss or for a pco situation so the best way is to do a low calorie diet with low gi now here again uh, we don't have much uh, uh, you know um, articles on you know a millet based diet because a millet based diet falls very low than a low gi diet So you know, and again, the millets are you know don't promote uh, absorption of uh, many other components like you know um, iron or the macronutrients. So you know, we need to really look into what kind of a grain are we dealing with because uh, this is you know kind of uh, the grain is one of the important thing which will help the absorption of the other nutrients. So stick to a local diet and local um, GI foods. So you know a local calorie diet always helps insulin resistance and fasting insulin, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. That means it's going to improve the lipid profile, and definitely your abdominal circumference is going to come down, and total testosterone also will come down. But it doesn't really work on fasting sugars. That means your blood sugars, if they're 100 or 102 or 110, a low calorie diet or a low GI diet doesn't necessarily bring down your fasting sugars. 
and your weight in Q and the free androgen androgenic index. That would mean that tells us that just diet alone doesn't bring down the complete metabolic profile down uh, by the NCD or low GI intervention. That would mean we need to bring about a lifestyle change to bring an exercise together. So additional diet guidelines off late, you know, um, because, you know, in today's situation, when you want to achieve weight loss, there's so many things to confuse you. There is um, green bean coffee, or there's some other nut, or there's some other seed, or there's some other green leafy vegetable or something. Each one is independently, you know, kind of analyzed and it's just given a tag that it does a good weight loss or things like that. And, you know, I see people drinking at least six to seven cups of green teas. So, you know, a green tea really helps in weight loss and fasting insulin and free testosterone levels in women, but can be had twice a day and just eight weeks or a little more than me, maybe a three month period because, you know, green tea or um, gives about a negative energy balance and creates more hunger. And uh, after three oh, months of having green tea, the hunger increases and start binge eating. So always uh, any kind of, you know, intervention, if you're trying to do, do it for the period that you really want to do so that, you know, you achieve the best result and then, uh, you know, slowly wean off the habit and get back to normal life and, you know, being active and eating cautiously and eating the healthy food. But don't stick on to uh, the weight loss, uh, green teas or black teas or, you know, green coffees or things like that for a, over a period of six months, eight months. So what happens is you're using a negative um, energy enriching foods for a very long time so the body composition changes happen. So then the issue is what could be the macronutrients? So now we understand that we don't have to eat the, the inflammatory foods and we have to stick on to the non-inflammatory foods. And then, you know, we know uh, what kind of uh, metabolic risk we have and how to go about it. So the macronutrients are carbohydrates can be 40, 45 to 50 percent. Uh, definitely go in, don't go into 35 percent because when PCOS, if you're trying to negotiate on a 30% um, carb diet, that means your you know, hyperinsulinic state is going to persist. So just generally do, do take complex carbohydrates and try to calculate your fiber. And uh, protein could be around 20, 30%. And uh, the quite a few emerging studies, you know, not 20% is animal protein. So, you know, one, one is to one, you can work on a vegetarian animal protein ratio. And you can work on 20 to 30% of omega-3 fatty acids, that is canola oil, mustard oil, soybean oil. So if you have an inflammation, completely change into these kind of omega-3 fatty acids. But if it's on the metabolic risk profile, cut down your oil consumption to 50 to 20 percent. So, uh, you know, you need to understand uh, which quadrant are you going to modify your, your calories. Suppose it's a metabolic risk. Uh, you have a high metabolic risk in PCOS. Go up on the protein 30 percent and cut down on the fats and uh, be at around 50 percent of carbohydrates. But if you're on the inflammatory side, beyond the 50 or 55 percent of carbs and beyond the 20 percent of your protein and uh, beyond the healthy side of the fat. So th these are the little changes that you do into macronutrient levels, looking at the, you know, kind of uh, the picture of PCOS you have. So we're going to look about the lifestyle changes. Let's see, um, you know, um, when a guideline is given, everybody tries to do in excess, like, you know, if you say uh, exercise brings about uh, weight loss or exercise brings about uh, PCOS, uh, you know, improvement, what exactly happens is we extensively uh, strenuously do the exercise. So, you know, when you do the strenuously, strenuous exercise, that would mean uh, every day they spend around uh, 60 minutes of activity, um, very rigorous activity. So that actually uh, increases, worsens the metabolic profile. Um, at times, the inflammatory picture too. So avoid strenuous exercise. Uh, maybe a 120-minute uh, active exercise per week is good. And, you know, maybe uh, 30 to 45 minutes of moderate activity, like walking, jogging, swimming, yoga. And even the walking is not uh, very kind of uh, fast and active walking. So exercise helps weight loss. Uh, it helps reducing sugars and free androgen index. That would mean when you do a low-cal diet or when you do a low-GI diet, you're not really uh, helping your fasting sugars or free androgen index and not brilliantly on your weight loss. But when you couple your exercise, you're going to do a brilliant weight loss and you're going to reduce your fasting sugars and your free androgen index. So I just want to take a little break here. So I'll be finishing my talk in another five minutes time.
Uh, so you, any questions can be taken after this, uh, my talk. So keep jotting down your questions for all the speakers. So meanwhile, I'll just uh, uh, cover a couple of slides. So uh, this is one of the beautiful article, uh, which is the, you know, recently published in 2017, Shetty et al. So they actually specified uh, what kind of Arabic training you need to have, because any PCOS uh, lady whom I see, um, they, they do exercise three times a day. So they go for a walk and they do a yoga and they do a high intensity and even the exercise programs that uh, been online now or they go to any other center um, a lot of activities are given that means if a lady goes to yoga she's doing pilates there and she's doing pilates with weights there and uh, in a yoga that would mean it's a very complex exercise that means um, see you may look at it as an exercise but actually the body has to cooperate with exercise. That means if you're doing weights, that means your muscles are going to pump in some cortisol in you, some insulin in you, and you know maybe you're you're doing in a fed. I mean, fed state is like you've taken something and go, you're going there, or you've not eaten and you're going and doing this. Suppose uh, you know a few of the instructors tell you to have a banana and a black coffee and go. That would mean you've given a huge. Uh, high GI food with a caffeine and you're doing it. That means you're making your muscles more robust uh, to produce more insulin and more cortisol. And you know, you're looking at a very uh, robust lean mass by uh, doing such things. And uh, after that, you maybe you're trying to have a breakfast or you may trying to have a lunch or something. That means you're doing carb loading before and after the exercise and with the caffeine. That would mean uh, you're not helping your PCOS. You, you are just, um, doing an exercise by uh, taking a carb before is, is like, you know, you're preparing yourself for a sport. So, you know, PCOS exercising is very, very different. That would mean if you have a very high uh, metabolic index, like you have high insulin and high sugars and, you know, uh, you know greater visceral adiposity, that would mean uh, your exercise is going to be um, early morning or three to four o'clock in the evening. Because uh, if you're going to push your exercise to late evenings, like, you know, maybe you're trying to do an exercise by 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., that means you're making your body more metabolically active before your sleep cycle. That would mean you're going to hurt your hormones, so you're going to uh, hurt the rest phase of the body in the night. That would mean your sleep hormones are not uh, uh, going to be great. Uh, that would mean your uh, melanin pigmentation, I mean, melanin hormones, melatonin hormones, and things like that, you know. So uh, the exercise has to be uh, somewhere around 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning or 3 to 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening. So they also uh, did an extensive study, and it's a review article. So that's the reason why I wanted to uh, showcase this. Um, what kind of Arabic training you need to have? That's five days a week, uh, 12 to 24 weeks. So there's another thing, you know, once you get um, into an exercise uh, module, don't get into an um, addictive module for exercise, like, you know, a high music, a high um, energy level or high exercise as a schedule, you know, you just can't get away from that module. It becomes, it becomes a window period for you to really spike up your energy levels. But then does it really sync with your metabolism? Does it really sync with your stress levels, you know? So any kind of a training you do for the goal oriented, that means you need to lose weight or you need to correct your hormones or you need to clear up your metabolic profile, do it for the specific period of time and gradually wean from that, you know, very structured activity and see that you don't gain weight. That would mean the body adapts with exercise and without exercise. That means with a negative energy metabolism and with a normal metabolism since trying to maintain the weight. So, you know, uh, do not be, you know, uh, 12 months on an exercise regimen of the same pattern. Try changing it and try uh, modifying the timings also. So there's a resistant training because, you know, this is another thing which is very important because uh, mostly, you know, resistant training um, is done uh, all days and uh, new exercises like kickboxing. Uh, these are also very strenuous activities which are being uh, given for weight management and uh, for PCOS weight management is definitely not recommended. So you can do uh, two to three days a week, uh, just 12 to 24 weeks. And then, you know, the number of repeats and uh, resistant uh, um, break periods, window periods, all is given by this particular article. 
So, you know, anybody who, who really wants to go into an exercise uh, uh, technique and go and look into this article and just understand uh, what kind of exercise suits you and also understand what kind of diet suits you. Give yourself a month or two or three months to really um, you know, tick off the numbers which are not good in you. So that could be your hormones and your sugars, your obesity index, your abdominal fat, your energy levels, and you know, um, your PCOS. So you know, before you conceive, give yourself a good winter period of two to three months to prime your body, to prep your body, to really uh, open up uh, for a healthy pregnancy and uh, follow it diligently. Uh, go through the questionnaire uh, and see if you're really into binge eating. Uh, go through the questionnaire every week and understand if you really come out of binge eating and, you know, sugar craving. So all these things, you know, we really need to um, put into work towards it. And then, uh, you know, you will have freedom from PCOS. PCOS is not one thing that, you know, just leaves us and never comes back. No, it can visit us again because it's all related to uh, obesity, stress and hormones. So it's a, it could be a frequent visitor also. So we need to understand if uh, we get into a PCOS uh, situation, what exactly is the problematic area? Is it a metabolic area or is it just the obesity area or is it really hitting our hormones? So, you know, once we understand uh, our metabolism and the areas that we get, we get a setback, uh, I think uh, we will be able to uh, protect ourselves from this PCOS. Thank you. And I think uh, it's open for questions. Yeah, I'm not sure if we'll be able to take all the questions. We'll try to answer a couple of the couple of questions and the remaining uh, we can take them on individually uh, through phone tomorrow or day after. So the first question is, hi, ma'am, I have diagnosed with PCOS and my periods are very regular and my testosterone are normal. I have minimal acne and weight gain and I have been planning for pregnancy from past six months. Please suggest me what I need to do. Dr. Pallavi, do you want to take this question? Sure that she has uh, regular cycles and her testosterone levels are normal and she just has minimal acne and weight gain. Uh, so it's been just a couple of months that she's been trying for pregnancy. And uh, if, if she has a regular cycle, that means she's ovulating on time. Probably she can concentrate on lifestyle modifications and try for another three months. In case if you are, uh, you know, uh, if you're not okay with three months, and then you can come to the clinic and meet us. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, when you're having regular cycles and your testosterone, testosterone levels are also normal, it's unlikely that it is PCOS. Maybe there are other reasons for you not getting pregnant, which has to be evaluated. Uh, which hormones are responsible for PCOS and how to control it? Please explain. See, basically the hormones, the reproductive hormones, that is the FSH and the LH are the two hormones which are produced by the brain, that is the pituitary gland. These two hormones go and act on the ovaries, wherein it is responsible for the egg growth and the egg release to happen, that is the ovulation. So when there is an imbalance of these hormones, FSH and LH, we see that there is a problem with ovulation. So especially the hormone LH is responsible for having increased male hormone levels in the ovaries and that is the reason that the eggs don't grow. So when we start treatments for uh, PCOS, we try to normalize these hormonal levels. That is, we try to reduce the male hormone levels and also at the same time try to correct the metabolic component. Uh, we have another question here. Hi, Dr. Pallavi, madam. My name is Divya. Happy to see you. We took treatment from you for my first kid, and now we are planning for second kid, but we are outside India. Any possibility for virtual appointment? Yeah, sure. We, we do have uh, visual consultations, so you can uh, you know reach us through the video, video consultations. Definitely, we can look into whatever best we can look into through the video consultations. And uh, Dr. Brinda, we have one question for you. Uh, can I know is it necessary? Uh, is it necessary? Can I know is it necessary protein daily? I mean, probably is it necessary to take protein every day? Is what that's the question. Uh, see, there's one study which says, says you know, uh, 
uh, body can store protein. So, you know, if you can have uh, three times uh, around 120 grams of fish and then put yourself on a vegetarian protein and egg whites, I think that should be fine. Not necessarily that every day you need to consume 100 grams of animal protein that way because the uh, body's capacity to store protein uh, is good unless until you're exercising. That means a particular exercise needs protein or uh, a particular situation needs protein, that's when uh, you're going to fix yourself onto protein. But mostly if you have to take a protein, um, you can take uh, vegetarian sources um, or egg whites because egg whites are also anti-inflammatory, uh, not the animal protein, um, you know, seven days a week. And there's another question followed by this. After weight loss, can I get pregnant? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you know, what kind of weight loss have you achieved when you know you really made yourself um, holistic and then uh, lost weight? I mean, uh, just weight loss uh, doesn't help the harm as much. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the quite number of questions. I'm not sure if we'll be able to take up in this question uh, in this uh, session today. So we'll take them up tomorrow. And uh, to conclude, thank you all for having participated. So PCOS, as we know, is uh, one hormonal condition where there's absolutely there's no cure for it. We can only manage the symptoms. Usually women go through irregular cycles and difficulty in getting pregnancy. So if it is just about irregular cycles, we can always give some hormonal supplementation for the cycles to come regular. But if it is when uh, fertility, when they're trying to get pregnant, it is important for them to you know, go through these fertility treatments because there's a very less chance, less than 5% for them to get pregnant spontaneously. And the other important aspect I would like to highlight is that correcting metabolic uh, imbalance is very, very important and for which diet is the mainstay of the treatments. Because we know 75% of women are obese and that is the problem. And I mean, that is the culprit for their hormonal imbalance. So working on the diet, at least if we achieve 10% of weight loss before, you know, they start uh, uh, fertility treatments, then the time to pregnancy will definitely be cut short and then the uh, response to these hormonal treatments is easy and the pregnancy can be achieved faster. So Dr. Brunda actually has highlighted quite a lot on the importance of diet in PCOS. Um, but in case if you want to have an individual kind of a diet plan, I'm sure you, know, you all should definitely consider, uh, you know, consult her personally and take the advice. So thank you all. Uh, hope to see you again in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.